All right, welcome back to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Ringside Seats Comics Symposium for another month. This week we are joined by our panel of amazing cartoonist guests. We got Rick Lopez, we got Craig CK, and we got Ray Carcases. Carcases. I always say it wrong. I always prep to say it right. I got it. You, Ray Carcases. You said it right both right. ways. Yes, I knew it. All right, and we got um, guest host Jason Lapidus and our special guest for this week, the first special guest, Kevin Delgado. What's up, man? Oh, what up, what up, what up? Good to see you, good to see you. All right, so let's start off like we do every month uh, with our plugs and with some opening salvos. Fuck, hold on, fuck the plugs, buddy. We got, I, I, this is this is like, I'm breaking in here because this is important. All right. So uh, Eli, Eli's made it known that he's, he's been at this uh, podcasting for 10 years. Uh, it's his anniversary. Um, I don't know if everyone understands the how important that is. Um, uh, whether it's Cosmic Line Radio, Can I Flip It, or this very symposium. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate and thank you for all that you do. I don't think people see the behind the scenes work you put in, um, which is vast and I know it is. Um, uh, and the fact you do it out of love for, for music and comics. Uh, not to mention all the help you've given and continue to give to everyone, including myself, no matter what the time or how insane the question is. Um, for me personally, I don't think I'd ever have put myself or my work out in the world if it wasn't for you directly. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, <clears throat> it's because of you that I've made lifelong friends um, through what you've created or helped create. Uh, you're a great friend who puts up with me and I know that's not easy. <laughs> Thank you. And hopefully another 10 years, homie. Hell yeah. Thanks, Craig, so much, Probably. man. It means a lot to have to, I don't know, that you guys are with me now and that, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Um, you know, when I started off podcasting and you said, I've got a podcast, people were like, what is a podcast? I don't even know what it is. And so much has changed since then, man. It's been an amazing oh. ride. And freaking Zoom changed the whole thing. I mean, if it wasn't for Zoom, like what you're saying, Craig, we wouldn't have had all this stuff, image grand design, wizard, everything. So, yeah, no. I just think it's important that, like, I don't think people understand the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes that you put in. And I know that for a fact, because I'm one of those idiots that constantly messages you about <laughs> stupid shit all the time. And you're always so gracious. I'm always and happy to time. answer. Stupid questions are more fun to answer because you yeah. got, yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, Craig. Uh, again, I guess then we can launch into plugs. That's a perfect segue for me. Cosmiclineproductions.com. Check it all out. You can, uh, Listen to all the different podcasts, podcast, YouTube. Check it out. Rick, what are you working on, man? Working on my strip for Next Panel Press. Uh, me, Eli Schwab, Craig CK, uh, Jeff Manley, and we have a few others joining us on very soon. I almost said names, I wasn't supposed to say yet. Um, but I'm working on my strip for that this coming Sunday. And then I still have. Uh, copies of my comic the power it's a four issue miniseries about a boy creating a comic only to discover a realm beyond space and time within his own mind um also working on the second issue of that in between my bi-weekly strips with uh, everyone on next panel press oh yeah all right what about you craig what else are you working on man uh same old i'm working on kirby and bob with all you guys all mm -hmm. my buddies um we got a uh, big drop coming tomorrow someone new joining and then we've got we've got plans for others and i'm super excited it's growing the goal is to have it like a almost like a a sunday sunday funny insert in news like in newspapers like back in the old days um and we're building to that and it's and it's great um i'm hard pressed and again some stuff wrapped up for wizard that you've basically <laughs> given me some time for um working really hard at the liefeld project with browers who is coming down to see me at the end of this month and i'm fucking super excited he's coming to hang out with me and tansy yeah. and uh and my kid and we're gonna draw and tattoo and the newest thing um that i'm doing i'm finishing up the life out thing and i'm starting into my murder she wrote comic book bro yes <laughs> oh that one i want oh yeah. my gosh so it's that's like, what like a new adventure oh. of, yeah uh, well my twist is like there's like this big 
theory out there that she was actually the killer the whole time. Actually, and that's yeah. that's the route I'm gonna go. I'm gonna make her the killer and have Angela have Lansbury her, strikes yeah. back. JB Fletcher <laughs> back at it. I've been like studying that stuff like mad. Ask Ray knows. Like yeah, we talked about it the other person. night. Yeah, we have yeah, we'll have murder she wrote chats. Because <laughs> it's on it's on the Hallmark channel, like from eleven to like from eleven from eleven and twelve or ten to eleven, ten to twelve, I think, Eastern time. And like and you'll see all these names, like you'll see like actors that like were past their prime but they can still act and then you'll see like like yesterday i saw an episode of brian cranston when he was like really young and it's like yeah. what the hell's walter white doing here and brian it was brian cranston it was linda hamilton before she got all buff for terminator 2 mm -hmm. i forgot what she looked like i was like man i forgot she was really 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 attractive i mean she was like really you know very soft very features and all that it was it was like three or four hours like what are they doing here that's the kind of weird show it is like you never know like like you'll see somebody before they became famous. Like, what's the name of that one well, female from fr from Friends with the black hair? Courtney Cox. Cox. Yeah, yep. it was like episode when she was before she, Friends when she was like really young, and I was like, "What the hell, man?" It's like they, it's like the the old stars got like a you know another paycheck, and the young stars got a break all at the same time. Yeah, it's a it's a weird dynamic, but yeah, there's some really weird stuff that goes on in that show. Like like characters just up and disappear with no explanation. So right. it's a great segue into like you know the perfect. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like super excited, and you know what? Oh, no. I'm so in love with with that character. I want her to be my grandmother for some strange reason. <laughs> That's all my grandmother watched was Murder She Wrote. That was her favorite show. So it's I already think associate with grandma. Yeah, it's it's not it, it's not as bad as you would think. It's not like Love Boat, you know. No. Like it's not it's not as bad as you would think. You like you're looking at like. Okay, this is kind of like a rip off of Psycho, or this is like kind of a thing, whatever. But it's not too bad. It's they actually have a Psycho episode. She's on Universal Studios lot. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's like, how do people want to keep continuing like being around this bitch, man? Like two hundred sixty-four people were killed around her. Like, <laughs> like alarm bells should fucking be going off. You know what I mean? Like, get the fuck away from this. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I had too oh, much. Man. I'm sorry, man. I've had too much. Uh, oh no! High no alcohol. Beer. Oh, high alcohol beer. <laughs> all right, awesome, Craig. We're mm -hmm. looking forward to all those projects, man. I cannot wait. Uh, Ray, you got anything coming up? i have just been doing. Um, I'm, I'm working with something on Craig, but more, more recently, I'm just doing YouTube videos that like nobody asked for, like reviews and whatever. I just what I read something, I like it, and then I just like. I just try to do something very simple to the point. I'm not going to be like comics journal, which is like, you need a PhD to write for no knock, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and at the same yeah. time, and, and at the same time, it's like, it's not like this sucks, you know? <laughs> Although I've, I've been, if I had like the, an iMac and like the resources, I feel like doing a spoof episode, like parroting like a million YouTube videos with like bad rock intros and like really bad, whatever, just, you know, whatever. As a, as a parody but somebody will take it for serious and probably like sue me yeah i uh i will say that th those those uh those videos are great i fell in love with the uh, nightwing series you turned me on to uh, yeah man it's good well tom taylor is is pretty consistent i mean he's not alan moore but he's not like a he's like an upper mid carter like he's not just yeah. like doing the job I mean you know he's he's like he's he's like with him you'll be entertained at least and some of the stuff he does is really good Outside of Red Room, this is the first, like, out, like this, well, not new, but, like, from the big two, this is the first book I've, like, repeatedly published, or bought now because of this, and that says a lot, because I'm not really, I'm not, you know, it is what it is, I'm just not into it, into it so much. Neither am I, sorry I'm making you spend more money. No, no, man, it, like, that first, <laughs> that first issue that he wrote, and that yeah. gets you right in the feels, you're like, oh, that hurts, you know, it was good, it was, it was good, really good. Yeah, 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 I mean, I'm not a big I don't read a lot of big two, but like if I find a creator I like, I'll get that. So now for some reason I'm getting a lot more DC, but it's because Garth Ennis is writing something or Joel Jones is writing and drawing something or Tom Taylor's doing Nightwing. It's like, oh, somebody's doing that I like. So that's what I've been getting. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Nice. All right. Cool. Thanks, dude. Um, that, that's a good name for your channel too. If you don't have a name yet is the, the comic review oh, show no one asked for. You know, yeah, you know, okay. I, 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 I've, 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 I've referred to it as that, and I think yeah. I'm gonna like go back and re, re, just re-add that. 
Yeah, you I think you need. I think you need to do some of the like the guys stuff on there too. I think that'd be dope, bro. Like if you did Rick's book and if you did Kevin's book. Well, you, you know, know what? I I I mentioned Rick's book a long time ago, but that's before I actually like broke down and spent fifteen dollars on an i on an iPhone stand. But um, <laughs> but um, but then his next book, I already seen some of the preview pages, and that thing blew me away. Insane, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, so anything that I get like that, I I will get. Um. But yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to issue two of the power. Issue one just kind of like it was like, wow, I had to read it like three or four times. It was just really good. It was like a um, like doing dabs to the brain with your eyes. <laughs> it's like hey, man. dabs for your What's eyes. Yeah. yeah, man. All right, y'all. So let's get into our first guest. We'd like to welcome Kevin Delgado, author, uh, author, writer, and artist of the brand new book, Tough Stuff, which is like hitting the shelves, taking spring break by storm, bro. This <laughs> book is insane. This book is amazing. It's wild. It's a romp, like a drug-fueled, insane. Oh, I got to read that. Pulp fiction. It's, it's insane. You guys definitely need to get it going. Kevin, welcome. First off, it's been amazing to have you. Like, let's just start with what, what, like, what all elements of your life did you bring into this book? Like, did you have like an insane spring break time? How much ecstasy have you done? Like, where is like, where does this all come in to your life? Don't fucking incriminate yourself, bud. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding um, about the ecstasy part. Um, so, so yeah, I've been watching, you know, CK for pretty much since its inception. Um, I always wanted to do like a documentary. So it's kind of crazy that they, you know, got to it first basically. But at any rate, um, the impetus for this book was COVID, being stuck in the house. Um, me and my brother would play a game called Tubi Roulette where we would go on the streaming service Tubi and just find like the worst movie we could find. And uh, we came up, what's that? Oh, I was just laughing. <laughs> we, we came across, you know, like um, uh, Samurai Cop. And from that, we learned of the director, Amir Kirvin, who like makes tons of these terrible movies with like Robert Zadar in them. They're amazing. They have no budget. There's yeah. like gratuitous nudity, terrible editing, terrible writing, you know, just like you name <laughs> So All bad. the stuff that makes for a great bad movie. Yeah, right. so I was thinking, like, dude, I'm just I want to make like my version of that. You know what I mean? And uh, I decided the '80s has kind of been done like to death. Like, yeah, Stranger Things, and you know, you whatever you name it. Like the '80s, we've we've gone down that road. And I'm a '90s kid, so I was like, well, why don't I set it in the early '90s, and I can do like the same thing, but it's throwing back to my generation, like kind of like some of my first, um, you know, memories and thoughts and all that stuff. So I remember like the zeitgeist of the time and what was going on in the culture. So I was like, it's gotta have something to do with like MTV's The Grind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like horrible B-movies from the era, you know, a badass character. I don't know, it, it kind of snowballed from there and I put it all together. Nice. The Grind from MTV. <laughs> that's how the book starts pretty much i mean it's like a beach party and there's like rump shaking yeah super, rich, super soaker you know it bridges like, that gap nicely too though because you still kind of get like an 80s vibe to it like it's like in the late 80s like busting into the early 90s uh, yeah. i well, i have you know how much i love this book i thought it was fucking a blast bro uh, i was not not submitting a, a pinup in into it you know in time i i, I wish i had it done that and had time to do it um so where, where are you uh, with the next one? So the second one's been written for a while. I've been kind of fine-tuning the script. And then I got to do some character designs. But I think I'll probably launch the Kickstarter for that in about a month or so. Um, okay. This month has been crazy. Like, I've had stuff every week. Like, some kind of event. Next week, I'm doing my first concert in, like, two years. And then after that, I'm going to Terrificon, which is like the biggest con convention I've participated in in a while. And then I've got stuff lined up for August already. So it's just really balancing my time flow, my, my workflow and, and time, because I do a lot of commissions. Like 
right now I probably have like 15, 20 commissions that have not even been released yet. So I don't know if you guys follow me on social media, but I'm always posting like album covers or posters or some, some, something, you know what I mean? So it's really just balancing my time because I still work. I, I just finished a Kickstarter. Like I spent my entire birthday on Wednesday, literally setting up packages and going in the mail and setting them out and like hand delivering some. And I, you know what I mean? Like my time is so booked all the time. So uh, with the next Kickstarter, you're going to include shipping to Canada, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go to the <laughs> discount. Let me see what that's about. Because I got to send to like Australia and shit. And then it was like 30 bucks to send a book. It's crazy. Yeah, but you know, like, when, I got when it comes to when it comes to stuff like that, like like I don't mind paying that shipping. You know what I mean? Because it, it you know it shows that you care about what you're getting. You know what I mean? Especially when yeah. it comes from guys in the group. You know. Well, all right. So without saying name, the book got picked up for publishing. I don't know when it's getting published. Oh, cool. I'm, I'm hoping that you know they, they can get it over there without you know paying all that stuff. I don't know what the fees are for all that, but. Basically, they're they're kind of dragging their feet on that because it got picked up months ago, and I just haven't heard anything. You can't you can't tell us who picked it up. Rhymes with I don't it till it's till it's in you know in the in the catalog. Oh, it got picked up by uh you know a smaller. I I really only wanted two publishers to pick it up, and it just so happened that the first person I submitted to the first publisher they picked it up. So I said, you know, whatever. There. Congratulations, man. That's fun. Congratulations. Awesome. Happy for you, man. Yeah, Good for you. Hey. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, until yeah, they tell me what's up, I'm just going to keep printing them and selling them. I'm not going to sit on it, you know? Yeah. Good for you, man. That's so crazy, man. It Thanks. just validates my opinion that it is so that it is so <laughs> good. You know what I mean? Like, people need to see it because it's it was awesome. Like, front, like, <sighs> full on. Like, start to finish. I had such a, a good time fucking reading that book, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah, I mean, I, I put a lot into it, you know what I mean? And it's and it's thanks to watching these videos every day, you know what I mean? Just watching how they how these guys dissect books and, and what they're calling out. And, and for me, it was a lot of things that I just wasn't cognizant of. Like, I wasn't thinking of, of doing these techniques, you know what I mean? I've seen them my entire life, and you kind of just, you don't think about how to do it, how to apply it. And then when they point it out, it's like, duh, you know what I mean? Add that to the arsenal. So, hell yeah. yeah. That's great. Ooh. Ooh. Got some drilling going on. Hey, Rick, you want to pick up next? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Kevin? Thanks again for coming on, dude. Absolutely. Okay, so there's a couple parts to the question. Um, so this, this was your first comic then? No, this is my... Oh, okay. 12th or 13th comic okay Before tough stuff i made a series called volantis and i'm still kind of working on it when i can but um i published copy eight issues of that individually um published a trade paperback that i've reprinted three times uh, i did a mini book called midnight arboris for um a rapper out of brooklyn called deuce ellis and then i did a comic for a college here uh Uville College I did their like employee guidebook or something it was like a 20 page book and it was like these two St. Bernard's and it kind of goes over like you know employee benefits and you know this and that whatever so I I've done a bunch but yeah this is my first like I don't know it's a different it's a different era you know what I mean it's a different no 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 age. totally but, yeah. so was this your first kickstarter this was my first successful kickstarter I had okay. um started a Kickstarter for the trade paperback of Volantis and I was close, but it didn't succeed. This one's more than succeeded. So, yeah. Was, so what, what do you, do you feel like you did something different or do you feel like, or maybe you learned a lot from the first one or, cause that's really what, like, I wanted to know, like, um, if this is your first Kickstarter, if it wasn't like, what did you learn from the other ones? And then obviously what'd you learn from this one? And like, so, how did you decide like, all right, Kickstarter? Well, one, I think the premise is like concise to the point and original. So that was like easy to sell because I could easily pitch this. The pitch is Troubled Alley Cat has to save spring break in 1993. And you tell that to people and they're like, 
yes. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. honestly, the other thing is, is I have uh, very well-known friends. So what happened was um, I'm connected with, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Griselda, Griselda Records, Benny the Butcher, West Side Gun, Kyle and the Machine. Well, three of the top like rappers in the game happen to be from Buffalo and I have some connection to them. And um, right before I launched the Kickstarter, I did this giant mural for West Side Gun's flagship store. So I have like this big comic book panel and it's him like at a wrestling match and he's got to save the head designer of Louis Vuitton and he's got to like do a macho man, Randy Savage flying elbow drop on like this like hating ass dude. And basically, I kind of just, I knew that was coming out. And as soon as he posted, I go, click. I had the Kickstarter already set up. I was just waiting for that to drop so I could, like, piggyback off that success, you know? Right. So having powerful friends helps, I guess. Um, that plus, I've done so many books. The book I did before this was that Diego one. So, you know, people saw that hey, this guy did a book for a college, like he's legit, you know, he's been doing comics for four years before that. And just that, plus all the commissions, like I, I've built a pretty decent name, at least locally for myself. And, you know, just a lot of people helping, sharing and, you know, networking. Just Like I don't, like I'm always grinding. So as far as getting it out there, that, that's really what helped it. No, totally. And like, and like, um, obviously like this one did way better. So it's like, and you talked about doing it again. So like, what, is there anything you learned from this one? Even like, where you're like, all right, the second one's going to be even fucking better. Mm. Um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Trying to think of new things to bring to people. But I think the overall response has been so positive that I'm going to get repeat business from a lot of people that back the first one. Um, totally. I'm trying to think of different rewards to offer but as far as that goes it's just been a very positive word of mouth um you know the proof is in the pudding and and i'm spoon feeding it you know what i mean so i just hope that the next one i think people want to see the progression of the character and where i can take this because my next story is bigger than this one i mean this is pretty pretty small you know he's he's on dingus and you know halfway through the book he doesn't be a hero to halfway through the book you know what i mean whereas in the next one the next one is empire strikes back that's that's kind of what i'm basing it off of so following that trajectory when when i said bad guys win which is great right empire strikes back it's the best the best thing ever to me anyways you i mean you walk walk away from that movie it's not, it's not gonna get you, want, you know so I, i'm gonna keep i gotta keep you know some of these tricks up the sleeve but yeah you know it's a little bit it's gonna be left field for sure nice. thanks rick uh ray got a question yeah i guess because i've had a couple of friends who've talked asked me about doing a kickstarter and they say hey do you need my kickstarter and i'm like no but I mean, I have thoughts, but I don't have not experience. But I mean, I guess like, what's the biggest, like, what's the biggest hole that you want to avoid with doing a Kickstarter? Is it like overcommitting how much money you spent? Is it um, not doing the numbers right? Is it, um, you know, the is it hard to figure out what your audience is or finding that that funding level where you're gonna like be able to um, successfully do the Kickstarter? That kind of thing. I'm kind of, and I've always been curious too, just from business standpoint, like, like that. Like, what's the like? What do you find to be the hardest? Right. Um, I think the hardest is just managing it and committing to it because I did a 45 day Kickstarter, and most people say to do between 30, 35, 40, somewhere in that range. Um, you got to commit to it and post nonstop and find new ways to promote it and kind of be annoying. But like the more you you know push it down people's throats, the more likely they are to to grab something from it. Um, yeah. As far as like the business aspect, I I just wanted to break even. Okay. I didn't care if I didn't really make a lot of money. I wanted to be able to afford to print everything, kind of make the 
the packaging, the design, produce it, get it out there. I wanted just those means to be covered because I can always reprint. I can make, I'll make my money in reprinting. I found that making money in comics when you're a self-publisher comes when you have like, like I printed Volantis on single issues, right? So once I hit six, I was like, okay, trade paperback. This is like kind of the first arc, whatever. It's already been paid to produce, right? So once I get the trades printed, it's all profit for me. And it's, you know, a higher profit margin because there's more story, it's bigger, bigger package. So you, if you look at it like that, you know, if you want to get rich, we know it's comics. We know it's not really right. going to happen. You know what I mean? But if you kind of do it right and, and you keep it growing and you already have the work paid for, like I produced it all myself. So I didn't have to pay any artists. I didn't have to pay, you know, any anyone for that stuff. So it goes right back in my pocket, but I just put it back in my company. So now I'm making, when I go to reprint, that's all profit. So I kind of looked at it like that. I'm like, don't take anything up front, take it on the reprints. And that way you can at least get the book done. You can get the word of mouth out there. You can get, you know, all that stuff kind of taken care of. As far as any other pitfalls, um, you know, really just think about it. You know, I, I didn't want to do anything that would overextend what I was capable of beyond making the book. Cause that's, you know, tiring enough. Right. So I would say do it within your means, uh, budget accordingly you know make sure you make some money on it um you know in business in my mind business you should make uh 50 of what it costs so if something costs five dollars you sell for 10 right that's just kind of how i always look at business so you got to factor that in plus shipping and all the other things i kind of knew what i was going for so i didn't like i said i didn't really care if i made money on this or not i mean i wanted to obviously but i'd rather put more into the into the book and into the experience so that the second and third Kickstarters are, you know, successful as well. Like I didn't okay. tell anybody, I didn't tell anybody coming in like a cool box. You know what I mean? This box is shaped like a VHS cassette. No, it's beautiful. You're you know not I mean? showing it. Yeah. Like I didn't tell anyone that that was a secret. I want to, you know, there's other secrets. I want to keep it like that to engage, uh, you know, more potential customers in the future. Okay. That's cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you. Such a cool box, dude. Right? Like, it's sweet. And I and I found a place to print them, you know, relatively, you know, inexpensive. Uh, not inexpensive, but you know what I mean? I didn't have to spend, like, tons of money. Yeah. Yeah, it's super cool. Like, like that you said you didn't tell people that this was an added bonus, but then now they get it. You get this package and you're, like, hooked. You're, you're like, uh, you know, we're yours for life yeah. and so you know every kickstarter and and you know I, i'm also a huge fan of the level where you get to be in the comic it's fucking genius it's really smart and for someone like me who loves themselves very much and likes to see themselves uh portrayed <laughs> you know like it was it was just fucking great and so of course i did it and it's so cool to see myself in there you even went extra and called the club the cosmic lion beach club so hot yeah. right now and i was like very <laughs> taken aback when i read that i was like hell yeah and i even get my head freaking crushed bro you, got the best cameo. you definitely got the best cameo oh look at it look at that hairdo i've been there <laughs> freaking can you great read, can you read the bubble please can you read what you say to this guy yeah 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 yeah. i'm like ain't no way your fat greasy leaking asshole is coming anywhere near my club you best get the fuck up out of here take your dogs with you and he's like dogs boom head <laughs> crushed <laughs> freaking awesome dude i love it that, i love that it, is man. awesome that greasy leaking asshole <laughs> and there's a lot of there's a lot of great a lot yeah. of great quips like that all throughout man a lot of like like illusions and like quotes the the fake movie ad demolition <laughs> ma'am oh it's great like it really is like for for 80s kids like myself and like i'm sure every, most people here um it, it's it's an amazing book to be a part of it's an amazing thing um let's open the floor up the floor is open for questions for everyone um we you know we're a smaller group today so i might just like call some people out here manny what's up dude uh wondering anything about kevin 
and it could be anything you know it doesn't have to be about his new comic what up will um shit man you put me on the spot but i guess i know hey if you read the chat i said i'm gonna put everyone on the spot um chat (laughs) you don't have to man it's all good dude no no it's good i I came in late to the game so was this wasn't your first kickstarter was it no okay his second his second okay um like when you did your first one, like what was like what were your initial steps into 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 getting one? Like what what's like what are the logistics of it? Like how do you how do you start an account with them? You know, with Kickstarter? Yeah, like what what are what does it take? Like what do you need? You just need to have a good business idea. You just need a plan. Um, I knew this book was an outlaw book. I was trying to do an outlaw comic, so I you know I had to do a black and white one. So the interiors right. are black as well that was that was going to be a sell um another one the regular version obviously since it was based in 1993 i wanted to go gimmick so i did a hollow foil right that's what i got so that was the basis of my kickstarter and then on top of that um i've kind of always drawn friends and stuff into my other books so i was like you know to, to boost up the the sales I'll draw you in the book for 50 bucks and you get a book. You know what I mean? So it's not too much to pay for. You know, it's a $20 book. You're paying 30 extra bucks to be immortalized in it, right? Pretty right. I think it's a pretty fair, pretty fair deal, you know? Yeah. And it's a double-sized book. It's 40 pages. So, you know, it was a good selling point. And then I also sold original art from the book. So I ended up selling like six or seven original pages at, a, you know, 130 bucks pop. Help me get no. numbers up. There, oh, that's not know? bad. That's, yeah. that was that was for the different like levels that you could that you could support, right? So right, right, and then you could buy like you could get a package where it was all three versions of the book. You could do that plus well, you know what you know what I mean. You just got to figure out how you're gonna do it and really figure out figure out the number you need, right? Well, let me I, ask you this: like, do they, do they have a minimum? Like, what's their their minimum goal? Do they have one or you said it? I. If it's anything, it's probably like a thousand or fifteen hundred. I would something. imagine it's something like that, but I mean, no, because I think I've seen five hundred dollar goals before. It, you know, it could be. I, I, you know, I think you just kind of set it whatever you want. I think no, goes sure. yeah. I don't know anything about it. Does anybody else know anything like that? Or no, I've never done one. Shit. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Manny. Dr. Yeah. Ben, Jason, Will, got any questions? Casper, Steven, welcome, y'all. Jason uh-huh. always has a question. I do. <laughs> I always, no, for sure, man. Mm-hmm. Thanks for being here, firstly. Um, I want to talk about Buffalo. What is okay. with Buffalo? No, I'm right just now? kidding. We're, I, no, no, I'm just kidding. We're, I'm from Toronto, and we, oh, we, we grew up on... <laughs> we we grew up uh, on buffalo television like that's our our u.s network affiliate so up- is everything everything in buffalo so I, I feel like it's a second home even though i spend almost no time there um yeah. so if, if you ever want to trash talk yeah. toronto and have a, some fun with some buffalo toronto banter i am down um anyway that all being said can you can you hear just a, a, should we pause for a minute to help you set up your tech uh, yeah sorry <laughs> we can see no, you we can hear you it's all good it's a good view you can you know you okay. can see the mess hidden in the corner it's all good yeah yeah so sorry That's no okay. it's all good all good um so anyway, i was just going to ask you about so my question for you is uh i have several but i'll start with an art one if you don't mind so yeah. my art question is really just about the technique of putting white stuff around characters. I, I don't know what you call it, like a white outline around characters to a, as a way to illuminate them a little bit on, on page or on a cover. And I'm in the process of, of inking a piece right now and I'm really conflicted around the, the technique of you know, having that, uh, that flatter look and trying to compose things in a way that you don't need to put a white outline around a character to make them pop out. Or adding the white outline to again bring them forward, separate them from the elements behind them. From a graphic design and drawing perspective, what is your stance on what the thing that like? So that is that the deciding factor for you? 
most of the time. Like, have you, are you, do you like <laughs> Arthur like, Adams? Do you like Art Adams stuff at all? Art Adams print right behind me. Right. So you know how he, on every single one of his characters almost, th- he won't finish uh, the line of the object behind it. He'll leave a gap between every object and the, ca- the character in the foreground so that they, they separate and stand out. So right. he, right? So as opposed to then you look at, let's say a guy like Kirby or, or another artist, let's just say, uh, yeah, let's go with Kirby. Kirby will, will finish the line of the character behind. So if it's the Fantastic Four, Mr. Fantastic is in the front. He'll draw the thing uh, right up until the his the pencil line is touching the pencil line of Mr. Fantastic. Whereas Art right. Adams will leave the gap. So just want to know, like from a, a drawing and design mechanical kind of point of view, right. what's what's your what's your approach? What do you like to do? Do you change it up depending on the piece? I would okay. So if I'm drawing a character like in space, like they're floating in actual you know star space, outline white outline around it just to make them pop more to show the um you know your pen line your outer stroke or whatever uh you know that's kind of the biggest deciding factor for me if the the background behind them is really dark and you want that that figure to pop i'll do that unless you're dealing with you want to get a specific lighting technique out then i won't do a a outline like if you want to have like uh like a high vibrant highlight give or take like hey let me show you something for sure man so like this this is a dark background obviously right but i didn't do any outline around it because i wanted like that spackle kind of look on the skull and on the hand and everything to shine so when i colored this you know that's it it really sticks out i didn't have to put an outline and that would have been confusing with the the way i had the background and everything right so I mean, it's kind of whatever you feel, but I always, my kind of thing is if it's, if it's in space, outline. If it's not, you know, really, or if the background's really dark, I always like to have yeah. something to make it pop out a little bit more. But I mean, it's really at your, you know, it's what you think is right, you know? For sure. For sure. That, that was my first question. Should I go on for the second one there, yeah. Eli, or should I? Uh... Yeah, sure, if you want. My, thank you. This is getting um, good. You're getting deep. I like it. Well, I thought, you know, we, if we got artists here, man, we should talk art a little bit. Talk technique I, for I, a I while. I'm a graphic designer, too. That's what I, you know, I, Strength. everything. Yeah. The city, I've done so much shit. That's, that's a good thing. I mean, so you bring a lot of experience to what you're doing, and then your decisions aren't, uh, they're not haphazard. Or, you know, I'm still making stuff up as I go and figuring things out along the way. So my next that's question for art. you is, a, is about the commissions. Okay. Um, for the guys in here who, who know me and have seen me draw for the last couple of years, uh, I, I like doing commissions. I think it's a lot of fun. And I like when we get paid for drawing stuff that we like. I think that's super cool. Uh, yeah. Do you have any tips for people who are aspiring commission or, or the ists, artists who do commissions? I don't know what you call <laughs> someone who does that. A commissioner? Oh, no, the commissioner is a person who does who asks for the commission. Um, well, are we talking anyway, numbers? Are we talking artwork, pages? Um, let's let's say artwork. I mean, just w- within our realm, I guess it's like uh, you know, like mock homage covers or or portraits of characters. Or I mean, maybe you think those are both bad ideas, and that there there's a an, a line that we can tap to um, get our work out there more and get you know get more sales and commissions. Or like uh, I don't know, just. I want to hear what your thoughts are overall on how to how to improve the number and price of commissions. Well, I think there's a lot with name equity. Um, as far as I go, I've been doing album covers and stuff for people for a long time, and you know, I give my friends a good discount, whatever. But I mean, other people, I I tell them straight up, I'm not afraid to throw a high number out there because right put a lot of work into it you know you put a lot of time you got to take away from everything else you want to do like for me like I said I just want to work on tough stuff and I'm spent the last two months basically doing commissions so um I turn them down all the time people don't like to hear no as an answer so maybe start saying no with throwing higher numbers out there and don't be afraid to you know I'm a people pleaser so a lot of times I'll take on more than I really want to do um which isn't good. I wouldn't suggest you doing that. I wouldn't suggest taking on jobs you don't want to do, even if you need the money. I mean, if you need the money, I guess you got to do it. But when you need money is when people take advantage of, right? True. 
So, so I, I should reject those requests for me to appear at parties to dance? Like you're saying, don't? Well, like, I don't know. Do you, to, do you want to do these commissions, though? Do you want to draw, like, someone's vanity project that you don't give a shit about? So sometimes, uh, well, if I don't give a shit about it, the answer is no, I don't want to do it, obviously. Yeah. But I love it when I give a shit about it. That's the fantastic moment. Yeah. When someone can, you know, bring you on board for something that they, uh, they feel good about, but also, you know, if someone's willing to pay you to draw something for a day, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess, you know, you got a pretty good grasp on it yourself then, but I would just say, you know, pick and choose. Don't be afraid to ask for the amount you actually want. Right. You know, don't, don't sell yourself short because then you're miserable because you're working nonstop and you're not enjoying life. And, you know, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then why are you doing it? You know what I mean? For sure. Do you find that there's like a, a way that people find your work other than your name equity, which I obviously don't have, and it takes years to earn, and that's like a, a widely respected thing. Do you find that there is a, a way that people get to your work, like let's just say through social media, like Instagram, um, do people find you that way for, for commissions, or do you find it's a it's mostly through brand awareness? Um, no, it's it's multiple things. Um, you know, definitely have a web page, an online portfolio. Um, yeah. Definitely have. Instagram, definitely have Facebook, you know, get your link tree together. Um, the thing that sucked is I lost my Facebook and my Instagram last year. So I had to start all over. So I'm trying to like tell people when people, you know, hit me up, how much is efficient. Yeah. They're looking, seeing that I have like, you know, 500 followers on Instagram. They don't think I'm anybody, you know what I mean? But my yeah. previous one had 2000. So like, let the work speak for itself. I don't know. I mean, just get your name out there. It, find every avenue route you know possible i mean i literally i don't need to work a job i'll say that much i mean, I do enough commissions and sales that nice. i don't do i do because if i left the company would fucking go under and people would be out of job you know what I mean? so it's a, it's a tough i'm constantly working that's that's the name of the game so yeah do you ever see that meme that says didn't want a nine to five now you work 24 7 it's, it's, yeah. fuck, it's so true yeah <laughs> thank you much appreciated yeah. sabers suck <laughs> they do oh. <laughs> Whoa. All right. I, i'm just teasing, well, I, was, just teasing. Look, look, I, I was i wanted the habs to win i don't know what happened they just didn't have it you know oh, come on tampa bay was a better team that's all <clears throat> they're, they're, like, they're super good they <laughs> thanks man all right guys yeah. Am, am I remembering correctly? You got you got yourself like uh, somehow uh, linked up with CGC, right? So your cut your covers could be uh, yeah. like graded and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not super familiar. I'm registered with them. I, my name's in their registry or whatever. I don't really, you know, a lot of a lot of my commissions and stuff go there, but I don't really you know, know too much. I get, like I said, I have a guy, I'm linked up with a company called 3D Comics and they do COAs. They do like, if you break this seal, it says void. So you can't get this graded anymore. So I'm in big with that collector's market through that store. So I don't really know too much more besides that. I just remember seeing you were like commenting on it. Like, like, I guess if, you know, I guess you can't get graded unless you register with them. Is that the idea? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. If people, you know, get commissions from you, a lot of times it's people they want to get, you know, the book slabbed and graded. And, you know, usually you have to do it in front of a witness. So you would have that COA. Um, a lot of times what I'll do now is if I'm doing uh, a convention, they always have like CGC there present. So I'll take the commission ahead of time, bring the commission there, and then just have it witnessed and graded and all that stuff on the spot. So, so. Yeah. Very cool. Does your book have to be like of any, like, does it have to be professionally published or does it have to have, does it have any things like that? Or can it just be like, uh, just as long as it's printed, it can be graded. Um, I've often wondered. I think you could just do whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah you, you can kind of send in whatever you want um, yeah. in most cases. In fact, I mean, you can send in just like original art. You can send in single pages, like incomplete Whoa. comics, and they'll grade it. Uh, it's very common, especially with like Grail books now, where you'll see, uh, you know, 
people like tore it up and it's missing covers or they'll just have like one page insert of amazing fantasy 15 and they can get that graded as one page insert right it, it, it's 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 kind of crazy they'll take just about anything i mean it's cgc they'll take your money no matter yeah, what yeah. like <laughs> they want money they'll, they'll slap, grade they'll, this bottle they'll of hot slap a label on, yeah exactly they'll slap a label on anything <laughs> I some dog shit sketch covers get graded and i was just like for what you know what i mean it's just people trying to satiate their ego or something i don't know yeah hmm. for sure Word. All right. Well, um, we're getting towards the end of the end of this um, part of the event. Anyone else have any other questions, Doctor Ben? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask him. Uh, I won't. I, I I haven't looked at you, at your project too much. Like I just I've seen a little bit about it, and it's about a cat. And as you said, he has to say spring break ninety three. Is that correct? Yeah. My, my, okay. Um. You said that this was your first Kickstarter project was unsuccessful, right? Yeah, this is my was that like a different uh what you call it like a genre? Like that's that's a, that's why I'm kind of like wondering too, is like what you consider this. Like is this almost along the lines of like uh I hate to say like funny animal book, but mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like Yeah. Do you um, think that that made any difference with like your success that's what i'm saying like with your if the one you had that was on that didn't didn't make it yeah. was that in the same style or was that like a you know like a vietnam like war journal or something or you know <laughs> no that, that was my series volantis and that's like it's a sprawling sci-fi epic and that's okay. just very hard to pitch like people would ask me all the time what's it about and i'm like oh man, it's in the future and there's like a family warring and people are dying and there's like fucking mutants and the, the atmosphere is shit and there's aliens that came from space. And there's like, you know what I mean? I don't have like this short, <laughs> quick pitch. Whereas Tough Stuff, Troubled Cat has to say Spring Break. It's that easy, you know what I mean? It's really just nailing your pitch. And as far as like what I would call this, I aim for an outlaw. It's an outlaw comic. I mean, look, you open up, there's dudes doing coke, um, the cat, the cat, look, the cat's got substance problems, dude. He likes, he likes to, you know, he likes to get, right. he likes to get freaky, you know what I mean? There's, right. the artwork is crazy. Um, you know, without giving too much of a way, it's, it's violent. There's, it's got all this stuff, the makings of like a NC-17 movie, pretty much. And I think people are just like, they want to see how crazy you can get, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Wow, it's, like, it's like Scarface meets Fritz. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I was saying. I was saying it's Robert Crumb meets Robert Liefeld. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. Robert on, right? You're in good with me. And, and kind of along those lines, I, I hate to like keep going, but I was, I've just been like wondering this too. Like I'm listening. I'm like, is this like, uh, like what you want to keep doing? Like you want to have like, you know, like 50 years from now, like you're on like Tough Cat volume like 30 or 500 or whatever you know what i'm saying like yeah. is this like like your jam or is this like just kind of like a, a chapter in in what you make you know what i'm saying like yeah um it's super fun to make and it really captured like my spirit and i are like i said i wrote the sequels right okay i've only announced the second one but i've there's, you know, there's more down the line. I don't see it's okay. So, without giving too much away, it's a. There's gonna be three, but there's also like room for more. Shall I, you know, say I want to go down that route? But what I learned from doing like a sprawling uh, sci-fi epic is like, it's a lot of commitment, man. I spent four years making Volantis, and I was like, as much as I loved it. It just like I stopped writing it. I was a, I had a co-writer, and I was just kind of like dictating what I had in the big picture, and it's just a chore. Like the artwork was very very intense, and like I'm glad I did it because I got better as an artist. But this one was just like every day I was like drawing on paper. I'm like this is fun, you know, trying out different techniques. Because Valantis I was doing digitally. This I draw by hand, so it just it was just it made drawing fun again and that's why i love doing it so 
I'm really dying to get back into the second one. I just have to like, I just keep getting commissions and I don't even ask for them. I turn them down. People like don't take no for an answer. So, but yeah, it's just a fun thing and it's different and it's new. And I think people like the character. They, they, they dig it. You know, they like the retro of it. They like what's happening. Like it's just a crazy fun book. Okay. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I meant. Like, you know, like it's, it's been a long day and, <laughs> those edibles were a lot stronger than i thought they were <laughs> but you know you know what i mean i was just thinking like is this like like just like a one-off thing like you know like a, you know like i said you know he's okay this he's doing a cat same in spring break but then yeah. like you know next year is it next year we were going to see the vietnam war journal you know so, but yeah so, you answered it. That's, i got so, that. that's cool well no at the end of the book if you read the book it tells you what's going to happen next so He's got nice. substance issues, so he's he has to go to rehab. In the sequel, the sequel is tough stuff goes to rehab. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh uh, yeah. He needs it. <laughs> he had too many edibles. I don't know. <laughs> he needs edibles. <laughs> hey man, I love the book. Thanks for doing this, man. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you, man. Man, you're the, you're great. Guys, love- if you guys want a copy, hit me up. I got black and white. These go for 10. Got the full color, 15. I've got the hollow foil, 20. Um, these are 30, and I hate to say it, but they're 30 because it comes with the COA, it comes with the seal. They're numbered. This one has, this is the uh, New Mutants 87 homage. So for 87 of 100, I did a little cable cat remark. Um, there's only a hundred of these made. I'm not reprinting these. The other ones will get reprinted at some point, but these are, you know, store exclusive. I have like maybe 20 of these left. So if you're interested, just hit me up on Facebook. Just hit me up in my um, you know, DM or whatever, and I'll, I'll set you up. All right. All right. And you're under Delgado Kevin on Facebook, but what about uh, everywhere else? Where can we find you? All right. Um, on Instagram, I'm solstice underscore art. And on Twitter, I'm frigid underscore giant. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us, man. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you guys enjoyed the book and the second one's even clear. Dude, it was awesome. It was like perfectly came in the mail today. I was super psyched. I read it. Oh my God. So much fun. Yeah. I'll read it again. Awesome. Cool, guys. Any other final questions for Kevin? All right, sweet. Thanks so much, man. You're more than welcome to hang out, but if you got to bounce, you got to bounce. Such is life. Thank you so much. All right, man. Thank you. All righty. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye. All right. And our next guest, we have Brenda Hickey, who is a comic book artist and writer. She's coming in right now. She is the artist of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. She illustrated Ward's Valley and her uh, Ward's Valley is written by Bobby Kernow, who uh, you might know from his work with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Maybe it's just me because I know all the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles stuff, but he is that. They named Kernow Island after him. I mean, if you're into the in, into the weeds. Um, also, we have, uh, and her creator and book, Halls of the Turnip King, was published in 2020 by her um, self publishing arm, Pegamoose Press, which you can also follow on Patreon, which is very cool. Brenda, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, welcome. You came in right in the middle of the intro. Uh, did I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Perfect. No, perfectly timed. It was okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, am I really this bad at Zoom? <laughs> I just oh no! Keep messing up. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. All right, so welcome. Right. It's great to have you. Um, Thanks for having we me. We are we are just talking about creation, and we're talking about like the work. Mm-hmm. Kevin, the previous guy, just released a book, uh, a Kickstarter book, and now uh, you did turn up. You did the Turnip King via Kickstarter as well, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. It was our first Pegamos Kickstarter, so it was a bit of a, a an experiment in that way. Like we didn't know what to expect. So yeah, yeah it was a good time. <laughs> Sweet. I mean, it seemed to have worked. Um, you also do work with uh, the wild Netflix cartoon. Now, I don't know if I'm saying this right. I haven't watched it. Agretsuko. Agretsuko. 
right? Yeah, Gretzko. Yeah. Gretzko. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looks so cool. I mean, it's like a heavy mm-hmm. metal, hard rock, like animal type. Yeah, yeah. Cause she's just like this kind of mild mannered um, accountant who works at this this office and she's kind of walked all over by her boss and just has to deal with annoying co-workers so to blow off steam at the end of the day she goes to the karaoke bar and just screams death metal <laughs> and kind of curses out her boss or her, anybody who's bothering her that day she's just kind of cursing them out through the lyrics it's really funny wow <laughs> that's a strange like okay so so this is a fun thing because you're mm-hmm. obviously doing a lot of work in developing like known properties mm-hmm. into comic books. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you write the My Little Pony as well? No, I didn't do any writing on My Little Pony. It was just the the line art for the pages. But yeah, Gretzko, I it's write volume. them, I draw them and I color them. Well, the first issue I did Sarah Stern colored, but since then I've been coloring it on my own. So. How do you find how do you find coming into something like that and and finding your own voice like through this character who's already a like an established voice? Mm-hmm. How do you make accounting interesting and how do you make death metal um, even more interesting? <laughs> <laughs> well, the good thing about the accounting because I I don't know too much about it is that it's not the focus. It's just yeah, the office right. the the day to day office grind is kind of more what they focus on rather than what exactly she's doing at work. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, like, you know, everybody knows what it's like to go to a job and have to deal with this whole slew of, of personalities and how you navigate that. And yeah, and just those frustrations, some people you get along with, some people you just won't. And so, and I mean, I, I always like, I, I like a lot of different kinds of music, but I, I have been known to like rock out to Ramstein when I'm frustrated. <laughs> I listen to so much Ramstein writing. They're, they're good. To get. <laughs> oh, they're so good. They're so good. I love them. I'll tell you as a quick aside, I got tickets to see them for September. I am very oh, wow. excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for you. That's Thank awesome. You. Their shows look so crazy. They look insane, right? Oh my yeah. God. You guys yeah, got to watch these live videos. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tickets were too expensive in the burn zone so i think we're oh, like okay. far enough away <laughs> okay you'll just get a nice tan and then you'll be good. we'll get a tan yeah. yeah in the inside arena which doesn't seem like the right place to see rammstein <laughs> anyway anyway okay so that's very fun uh anyone else uh craig you want to you want to go yeah you just uh have you have you worked on my little pony straight from the beginning for idw like you guys yeah. just have, so that's a hundred issues yeah like, i mean i was in april yeah, it'll, I think it ends at 102 issues, maybe 101, 102 issues. But yeah, issue 100 just came out this week and I did a little three page um, flashback right. scene in that. But yeah, I came on pretty early with the first side series they did, the, the micro series. So Applejack was the one I illustrated and it was a great intro to it because I got to work right with Bobby Curnow, who was the editor at the time. And he, because he wrote the story as well, so. I got to know him quite well collaborating. So, which right. is, I think, because we worked well together, I think is why he asked me to do Ward's Valley later. So, nice. Yeah. Eli's turned me on to, to you and, and Troy, and I, I joined your Patreon and whatnot. And uh, I've been seeing your other work and stuff, and it's, it's really impressive. But, oh, thank you so long, much. To me, that's quite a long run. Mm-hmm. like for a hundred issues of my little pony like uh, yeah you gotta, you gotta be committed you know what i mean <laughs> like, i just you know like it's really interesting to me it's not it's like the subject material i'm not a fan of obviously but mm-hmm. just to be able to continue to go at that and stuff that that that's got to be that's got to why be do you say but, obviously craig you never know like well, yeah, you, never know. Be action you, you know there are there are craig, bronies yeah there craig the brony we know it <laughs> we know the truth yeah man yeah they're, yeah they're, they're, yeah, man, their guys are like buff and like from the military and stuff, and they show up oh, to conventions yeah. and they're bronies, man. They're hardcore. Hey, like, they're mem- mm-hmm. members yeah. of the herd. But <laughs> like, <laughs> they're everywhere. It's gotta, be, it's gotta be like if if how invested were you in my little pony to, to like stay on board that long? Like was it hard to do or relatively easy or uh I did I did have um breaks here and there with it like I wasn't on it as much as like Andy Price and Tony Fleece I think out of the main people I was probably one of the one of the fewer ones but um so yeah it's like it's a long haul but because there's so many artists that you kind of tag team you're like okay I'm done you're in that sort of thing but I did take quite a few breaks because when I first started it 
um, shortly into it, I, I had my, my son, Nathan, so I had to take a chunk of time off just to deal with being a new mom. And then, of course, when Ward's Valley came along, because Bobby was the editor, he could kind of juggle the schedule. So he knew to kind of take me off ponies to put me on Ward's Valley. And Ward's Valley, again, I did the, the coloring as well and the lettering. So I was quite invested in doing a big load of that. So it took quite a bit of time. And then I took some time off to finish Turnip King. So I was kind of like in and out, ducking in and out. So I'd come back, but I, I did enjoy it very much because I, I'm from an anime and manga background. And so the art style just instantly jumped out at me as something quite appealing in my eyes. So I was like, okay, I really like the look of the show. And it was all over the internet, of course, when it was first out. So when I saw the pictures and I was like, I like the art style and it's very interesting. And then I heard there was comics of it coming out. And I was like, I, I want to get into comics because I, I hadn't been published at that time. I was like, I just came off a contract with a graphic design firm and I didn't have a good experience. And I was like, okay, this contract is done. I don't want to look for any more graphic design work. I know it's not for me. So how do I make comics work? So ponies kind of came around that time. So I was like, well, this is something that I'm just instantly drawn to and there's comics of it. So I'm going to watch the show and really see if it's for me. And it, it totally was. So luckily, Troy, my husband, who's also doing comics, like he had ins with IDW. So he could kind of like set, like ask them, is it okay if my wife gives you a portfolio for my little pony? She's quite interested. So the portfolio was what got me the job once I did some sample pages and character stuff. So yeah. I, I asked because like everyone here knows I'm a huge Archie comics guy mm -hmm. and I don't even know if I could do a hundred issues of Archie. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You have to be, you know, you have to have some kind of, uh, like, to me, that's a huge commitment. And, uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty wild. It definitely, yeah. And the other yeah. stuff I'm seeing on the, on the, on the Patreon, it's, it's really, really nice stuff. I've, uh, oh, thank I've, you. It's one of the Patreons I definitely feel that uh, you get your, you get your money's worth out of. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm an Archie fan as well. So when I was a kid, we didn't have a ton of comics in my house, but we had a whole shelf on our bookshelf that was Archie comics. So I read a lot and I'd copy the Betty and Veronica outfits for the stories I'd write with my sisters. So I learned to draw the fashion and stuff that way. So fast forward years later, I met Dan Parents and I told him that and he thought it was, he thought it was pretty cool. I was like, here I am now doing comics. And yeah, he's done Archie forever. Speaking yeah. of people yeah. who've done long runs. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. it. It's just like I said, it's like, you know, you see these people doing like these, these, they're not creator own properties, but have the stamina to keep, to keep going. It says a lot about yeah. you and, and dedication and there has mm. to be some kind of attachment to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah Great definitely. Stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, cool. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Rick, you want to go next? Welcome, sir. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet Hi. you. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I'm quite excited to be here. So um, when Troy was on the last time, he we saw you in the background and everything. And, <laughs> and then he told us how you would worked on comics, too. And I thought that was so cool because it's like, meeting everyone on here and on zoom you know like before that I'm just kind of drawing on my own like working on my book and my stuff alone mm -hmm. and so like having them around you know like um not so much as motivation but more so as like you know like feedback and like learning and that sort of stuff you know so it's like mm -hmm. to have to have you and tr like you and uh, Troy to have each other like that you know like that's a really neat dynamic and I feel like that has to help so much to have to have mm -hmm. each other around you know to really be able to like work on things together or like hey this doesn't look right you know or whatever sort of thing you need and I think that's mm -hmm. so cool like how you guys do your patreon together and everything and it's just mm -hmm. like yeah. you know um I don't know like what's that how is that like you know because I'm sure there is like some sort of like fun little competition back and forth I'd have to imagine you know but it's mm -hmm. like I don't know. Yeah. I just think that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're pretty good to work together. We know a lot of couples when they hear our situation, they're like, Oh, I couldn't 
stand being home with my partner all day long and we're like well for us you know we we really miss each other when we're not around so I guess we are quite unusual that way but yeah it does really help um because we we understand what each other are going through like if you're really into the work and you just are like you know I just really want to get back to work after supper and you know the other one really understands and it's like well don't worry about dishes you get to what you're doing if it's deadlines you just you know, really want to get that done <laughs> or, you know, on the, on the flip side, if you're having a bad day and you need, you just need some extra help and, you know, and you're like, I just can't figure out this layout. It's been bothering me. And then because we think different, we're like, well, why don't you, like, if I was approaching that, I might try this. And it's like, oh, I wouldn't have even thought of that. So yeah, it's definitely super helpful if you're stuck. And I know now that I'm getting into like the writing for a grad school too, we'll always bounce ideas off Troy and I find it super helpful to kind of have him as a sounding board of what's making sense and what's not making sense in the story. And just to have someone positively reacting to what you're saying too is helpful because I don't know if you ever get in this headspace, but you feel like, well, is this a good idea? And the doubt sets in and you're like, you know, you might have been onto something, but if you don't have kind of that positive feedback, you might be like the confidence might go down a little bit. So having somebody be like, oh no, it is a good idea. And I think it's worth pursuing. Or if you think of it this way, it could be stronger. Like it, it really, really helps <laughs> me, especially in like, yeah, no, I've been able to help Troy at times too. So it's really good. And it makes you feel good when you can help somebody as well. Oh, that. totally. So, That's so yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah see, that's what, that's pretty much what I imagine I was, when he was when he was like talking about that because like I'm like thinking you're doing who whoever knows what kind of work in the background you know and it's like oh she's doing comics too like that's so cool like even just to have a friend that would like even a roommate that would be that, to me that'd be so cool because like the zooms have helped me so much I can't even imagine ha yeah. having someone that close being like oh no here this is how we do it yeah that's I'm so glad cool. you found the zoom and that you're able to get that kind of thing too even remotely like I'm really glad yeah. for you for that. Yeah. No, and likewise. That's awesome. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you too. Yes, it's very cool. I mean, mm. once you get in a groove, like with someone mm. else, like creating with you and, and you mm. can throw ideas back and forth. Oh my gosh. It's nothing mm -hmm. like that. Nothing like yeah. that. Whether yeah. it's a, a husband or wife or a friend or a girlfriend or even Rick, when you came down to LA the last or two weekends ago when we were drawn together, man, that was very fun. Um, all right, Ray, and then we'll get over to you, Will. What up? What you got, Ray? Hey, yeah, quick question. Well, you know, congratulations on doing the work for a hundred issues, a <laughs> hundredth issue. And I was just wondering, when you started working on this, did you, are you just like busy doing the work or does it like sit on you, like hit on you, like hit on your brain after a while? like? wow, we actually did a hundred issues of this because that's an accomplishment for any comic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and trying to like piggyback what Craig was saying, like, I, I'm not the target demographic, but I know there is a huge, really strong uh, following for the characters mm -hmm. and the book. It's a great franchise. It's a great property, mm -hmm. but does it hit you like, wow, we actually did a hundred and we're going to do a few more. Like, mm -hmm. cause that, that's, you know, that's a uh, eight plus years of monthly printing. Yeah, yeah. And to think that an all ages comic accomplished yeah. this is even bigger because yeah, usually we, they don't make it that far. So it's really, really good to have that solid community like the Bronies have been a huge reason we've made it this far. And that's really great because it's so good for young readers too. So to keep it up that the Bronies kind of that solid fan base, but then also it's a really great read for a new reader uh, in comics. It's that's that's one of the exciting things about me with ponies is because it's for young readers you can be somebody's first comic and that's really exciting that could build a lifelong love of the medium and that's really really cool so to know that you've had that many years of comics influence for not just you know the the core fans but also the, the next generation is it's pretty pretty amazing and mind blowing. One. Right, and also adults because a lot of the fans, a lot of the bronies, they're mm -hmm. no, they're they're adult males. It's not like yes, <laughs> yeah. It's not it's not like boys or you know like mm -hmm. early teens. There's you know yes. you have a, a you have guys in their twenties and thirties mm -hmm. that are rapidly supporting it. I just thought mm -hmm. about that because I was looking at it because I don't follow. Sorry, I just don't 
fall yeah, asleep no that worries. much. I did, I, did, yeah. I, did look at, I did look at the are you thing. It's wonderful. Um, mm-hmm. But I was thinking, wow, 100 issues. It's like, and it's going on. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, because guys, because most books like feel like, most companies feel like, I mean, publishers, I mean, publishers like they have to re, re set the numbering to kind of like mm-hmm. bring spark to it. And mm-hmm. that whole thing of 100 issues, 100 something issues is like almost like a lost. I don't know if it's like a lost art or people just don't have faith that they can do it or I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's kind of yeah. like why we're trying to the question. So I appreciate your insight because oh, okay. I know that you're doing the work and you're doing the art for it. I mean, you care, but you're doing mm-hmm. the art for it. So I don't know if like sometimes you reflect back and you're like, wow. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's like I, the, I first started working on this on issue 23 or 20, something like that in the 20s. And you're like, mm-hmm. now we're eight, now we're 75 issues in, later. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, yeah. that, I, that would hit me. Yeah, and the neat thing about Ponies, too, is they've got the main series reaching issue 100, but then they had so many side series, so probably all together, I think somebody on Twitter had said, the comics in total, if you take all the side series of, like, Friends Forever and Legends of Magic and the holiday specials, they're like, it might even be over 200 issues, if you count, like, everything that has the My Little Pony uh, comics in it, but yeah. That's That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of the team. Like everybody that works on ponies is just fabulous. Like the writers and all the different artists are just fabulous people. So everybody's really, it's a bittersweet thing to see it end. And um, we're all quite proud of the people and the, and what we've accomplished. So. Yeah, you should be. Well, thank you very mm-hmm. much for your thoughts and answering. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. All sure. right, let's go over to Will. What up, dude? Hey, hey, hey. how's Hi. everyone doing? Hello. Um, Hi. So a couple things that, that came to mind. Um, one is um, anytime you hear about something, someone working like on a significant distance on a cre- on a franchise property, right? Um, not like a creator owned deal, but you're, you know, some kind of licensed property. All I, my first thought was, uh, you know, it took us years to know who like Carl Barks was right working yeah. on the duck comics and okay. then I and then all I could think about was do you guys do the artists of, of of ponies have like a fight over who's the good pony artist you know like <laughs> is there, the, it kind of any 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 uh infighting or any uh any uh uh any like like just fun ribbing with the other kind of pony artist uh my my thing is I'm not much of a river so it probably <laughs> is happening all between the other guys <laughs> I'm just kind of like everyone's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of my stance. But. And then, and then a couple other things that I, I'm curious mm-hmm. about from from someone who works oh. on like a property, like oh, <laughs> we, got a, we got a guest. Oh. Um, is is one <laughs> one? Um, did, does the franchise or does the the publishing house do they give you do they give you guys like a, a like a style guide or like a like a like a franchise bible that you kind of have to follow when you're developing your art or your stories is that is that something they for i know for some some brands they do some they don't I, i'm just kind of curious what how ponies went about that mm, yeah when i started they gave me a big pdf of mm-hmm. a style guide but hasbro that. has always been fantastic to kind of let us our unique voices shine like Andy Price is very like, he uses a lot of heavy blacks and hatching and it looks very like, um, very comic booky. And that has its it, that has its appeal and it's just got his name and his flavor all over it and it's great. And then you go to like Tony Fleece who's just got more on brand, very solid, solid drawings. And uh, not that Andy's aren't solid, but you know, like different right. in a different way, like cleaner, so, very solid and, yeah, and then Jay Fosgett, who does super cartoony because he loved Muppets and Looney Tunes. And you can see that, you know, kind of Looney Tunes energy in his. And his are very off model, but they have that great appeal to them. And Hasbro is just like, perfect. We love it. It's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I I try to stick close as I can, but I mean, you can't help but have <laughs> your unique flair. And they didn't sure. mind. Yeah, they didn't mind or ever really give me many many notes about stylistically how I would approach sure. it so and I really like that because again speaking of Looney Tunes again like you can tell the difference between like Chuck Jones and some of the other guys so you're just Tex like, Avery or Tex whoever Avery, else is yeah. Right. yeah yeah so it's kind of it kind of feels like that when I think about the art style and the pony comics it feels kind of like that old Looney Tunes thing where everybody has their unique way and it's close enough that you know who's who and mm-hmm. that's really all you need and yeah 
and so with that w one one last question i'll let you mm -hmm. get, get over to the next uh but uh Mm -hmm. uh, just curious, did you ever have a, uh, do you have any funny stories or did you ever have a situation where you kind of pushed the boundaries with the art and thought they're going to, they're going to reject this or tell me to redraw this. They don't want the ponies doing X or Y. Did, did you ever try <laughs> anything, uh, anything fun there? <laughs> yeah, I, I did push some of the expressions sometimes. Like I'd make their faces go a little bit weird because I saw what other people were doing. So I'm like, I don't have to be so rigid. So if I make like some crazy faces, like there was this one issue where um, the fair is in town and there's all these booths selling different sweets and Pinkie Pie loves sweets, the pink party animal one, crazy girl. She loves these sweets and they're the one sweets that actually do make her go crazy compared to like the other ones. Oh no. <laughs> so she's eating these sweets. And so I'm like making her kind of deteriorate as she keeps eating more and more. And there's one panel where I actually drew it with my opposite hand <laughs> and turned my opposite <laughs> hand. So it's kind of like squiggly, messy. I was like, I wonder if they'll let me do this. And that passed. And then another one, she's biting her nails and she's all really freaky looking. I'm like, I wonder if this will pass. And it passed. For this other episode where this another, it's, oh, it's always with food, but this guy like was, was binging and he kind of got, like he was in shape trying to join the army or in his town. And then he was like binge eating and celebrating with his friends and going out to the pub too much. So he shows up kind of messed up the next day. And so I drew him really bloated. And there's one part where it's like butts big. So he had like a butt crack. I'm like, I wonder if they'll call the butt crack. <laughs> I never did. So yeah, I'll try to push, push things here and there. Like just silly like that. Mm -hmm. like nothing, nothing too severe, but it's like everyone likes a funny butt crack. <laughs> so let's oh, yeah. see if it gets if I can get away with it. It's it's a, always a great gag in comics so, or in cartoons, <laughs> just like the uh, like like the boxers with the hearts, you know, mm -hmm. like when when they like bite, you know, the the a dog mm -hmm. bites the pants or whatever. It's always a great gag. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> awesome, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Will. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the quote of the day. Everyone likes a funny butt crack. So uh, I just put that one in the comments yeah. there. <laughs> I have a five-year-old sense of humor, I swear. Hey, it's just, it works. I've never evolved beyond bot potty talk. <laughs> hey, that's that's just solid what is funny. for like yeah. Everyone will find that funny. <laughs> Quick shout-outs. We got Donda Soze who joined us. What up, Donda? And uh, what up, Doug? My father mm -hmm. joined us. What up? What up? What up? Glad to have you, Dad. <laughs> All right. Our next question is coming from Kevin. What's up, Kevin? Our, our previous guest is talking hey. to our current guest. Hi, how are you doing? Titans. Yeah, sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> no, <laughs> how dare you? I know, I know, I'm just like that. <laughs> it was the best part of my portion. Um, <laughs> what, uh, do you have like a, without giving too much information, do you have like a dream project you want to do? Or is there anything on the docket that's like something that's coming directly from you and not like a licensed property? Yeah, that's that's definitely it. It's, um, doing some more creator own projects is the dream. So I yeah. love the license stuff, but I definitely got into comics to tell original stories. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I've got a new Agretzko that I'm just at the beginning of doing, and it's going to be a four issue mini series. So it'll take me into next year, but I'm hoping that once that wraps up, I'll be able to full-time dedicate to my next project, which I teased at in my Patreon. And I wish I could give you a title, but I can't because I don't have one yet because I'm terrible at titles. But um, I don't know. I, I'm looking forward to finally getting back to that and really starting to see those pages come out. I'm really excited. Yeah. Awesome. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, all right. Jason, I think, was next. Jason Lapidus. Hey, how are you doing, Brenda? Good. How are you, Jason? Good. Thank you very much. Um, Will touched upon some of my, my questions as well. So I was really happy to hear you talk about working on licensed properties and such. Um, but I wanted to just ask you about gearing up to taking on um, those kinds of character models. Mm -hmm. what, was your, what was your prep exercise like or your prep exercises to get ready to start the, your run? So like, was it a, a matter of days, weeks, months of sketchbook doodling to really solidify those kinds of, you know, to, to get in your mind a 3D version of each of those character models? Mm, um, and then, but, and then yeah. I also love to know if you, I'll let you go, but um, mm -hmm. how you then, once you were up and ready and going, 
uh, how did you or did you tweak or how did you tweak those characters as you went along? Mm, yeah, um, I always start with the sketchbook, always with the sketchbook. Um, <laughs> I've got some very embarrassing ponies in some sketchbooks from years ago. I was like, oh, how did they hire me? <laughs> but um, yeah, you just I just go to the sketchbook and I would just kind of feel it out, feel the shapes, kind of break them down to like the, the spheres and the circles and like try to pose them and stuff. And, and then I took to like doing character sheets for each of them to really explore the personalities. So just like a bunch of say Twilight Sparkle and how would her acting be? Like, I like to focus on the acting and like the structure first, but yeah, the acting is kind of the fun part for me. So I'll be like, okay, this is how this character would emote or this character would emote. So I assembled the best sketches that I had and I cleaned them up and did like little character emotion sheets. And yeah, I find, I find like um, once you put it on the page and you have it in action, that's where I really start to feel the characters. So you can, you can put them on a sheet like in your sketchbook, but they don't really come alive alive until you start putting them in the narrative, which is why I love comics so much, just to see that life come out in the characters and just how they move from panel to panel. So yeah, then I did the five pages and yeah, you just kind of like do the best of your ability, best of your ability. And um, yeah, there's um, little notes from Hasbro that would come back would help to kind of make and refine so things. I'm like, oh, I'm, I never thought about that or I never thought about that. Or maybe even sometimes you might notice a little comment from a fan being like, oh, the this part of the face might be a little off or you know, maybe the acting with the hooves could be, you know, what if they thought of it this way? So you kind of like pick up little bits depending on where the little pointers are coming in and you know, you can either agree with them or not agree with them. But yeah, you just kind of kind of take that. And then yeah, over the years I never like I the the best thing I ever invested in was the my little pony art book for the TV series. Because yeah, once I got that and I could really like look at it and the backgrounds and everything like I just found like my style got stronger and stronger the more I really referenced the the show and yeah with that book I love that thing so much so and then regrets go too like you've got to go back and start the process over again get the sketchbook out and that just the one thing I loved about ponies was that the bronies did do a lot of work for you that they had like wikipedias of every reference you could want google was just like everything was labeled every that he knew everything agretzko has been a little trickier because the fandom isn't as um as dedicated and as as large like ponies was just this well of, of visual and information it was so I was quite lucky for that. Any background I wanted, they had a vector redrawing of it on DeviantArt. So yeah, wow. so yeah, it was really, really a blessing. So thank you, Bronies, for doing all the work. <laughs> I could, you could help me so much. <laughs> thank you, Brenda. Yeah, thank you. Sorry if I was rambling. <laughs> no, it was good. I, I, that was my goal is what can I do to get you rambling? No. Okay, good. I'm, thank I'm just you. teasing. No, that was really Success. good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks jason pleasure all right we got the good dr ben anthony up what up ben uh hey. nice How's nice it? to meet you brenda definitely yeah, nice to meet you too ben it's funny my, my question is, is basically about uh you know the fan community mm -hmm. ponies right and mm -hmm. you know obviously the uh the bronies are dead you know everyone knows about them you know my question mm -hmm. is like what how how did you see that and i guess also also the other artists that you interacted with that were on the on the on the books what was what was the majority of the fan community like interacting with them was it like they were just just there for the ponies or were there was there like uh you know were they also like distinctly interested in you as as artists you know what i mean like were they like yes brenda does the best uh twilight sparkle or you know that she does the mm -hmm. best uh flapjack or whoever you know or is it like <laughs> yeah or they just like oh, it's a new flapjack series i gotta get it and it's mm -hmm. you know like they didn't that, that's my that's my question is like what was what was the fan community like are they 
just on the franchise or are they also looking at it like there's artists doing this and we want to you know appreciate like what they're doing you know yeah. Make- mm-hmm. yeah yeah i understand what you mean um it definitely depended on the fan because a lot of them because i mean it originates from a show right not everybody's going to be reading the comic series but the people who love the comic series well as well like not just as a collectible thing but as as an art piece and as the stories they really did follow the artists and they loved getting the commissions from the, the specific artists and everybody kind of would have their favorite ones. So um, I was very lucky to be like a lot of people would say my art was one of their favorites and I'm, I'm very fortunate for that. I really appreciate that feedback that people responded quite well to, to what I brought to it. So um, I know the, the, the bit of the trick with going to the, the pony conventions though was that um, I'm kind of in a remote area. <laughs> and so I was maybe one of the ones who couldn't get out to as many compared to the people who lived in the States who were at those big city centers that could pop over quite often. So I didn't get to meet the fan community as much as some of the other pony artists, which was, a, you know, I kind of felt that loss at times, but I understood the situation. If you just live in a place that's not a big city center, you, you know, those are, that's just the reality of it. but. Um, and also I'm not super, super active online. I could do better on Twitter, but, um, I'm just kind of quiet online. So there's also that. Um, but yeah, everybody was, who loved the comics was very, very responsive to us as individual artists. And I really did appreciate that, but yeah, it depended on the fan if they, cause yeah, being from a show, it's not going to be everybody who's invested, but the people that were, we really appreciated how much they supported us and how much they really followed what we did and appreciated the nuance that we brought to it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's what I'm saying. Like I was, it's, it's, it's something I wonder with like, with a, you know, pretty much any kind of different like franchise thing, like mm-hmm. how much of a crossover is gonna be between, you know, people that just wanna see, you know, He-Man or is it gonna mm-hmm. be like, man, I wanna see He-Man, but I wanna, I want Lee Feld to, to draw it, or you know, I want mm-hmm. I don't know Frazetta, or I don't I don't know who does yeah. it, but yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, we've been lucky too that you know people will will get to know our work from ponies, and then they'll kind of follow us and see what we're doing personally or just on other projects, and that's that's also been very fortunate too. The people who want to go beyond the ponies is like a huge, <laughs> huge blessing. Like we really appreciate it. <laughs> Go beyond the ponies. Beyond the ponies. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, man. All right, cool. So let's go back to Craig CK for another one. What's up, buddy? Hey, you touched on a couple things and it just some stuff mm-hmm. registered with me. Um, yeah. How, how hands on was Hasbro with like the designs in the comic books? Because I know like they're very protective of their properties and how they're displayed. Mm-hmm. And it just brings to mind like, they released a Transformers series in the 90s on TV mm-hmm. and like they had to, you know, change exactly like they would as a toy. They weren't allowed to have shadows. So you um, just briefly had touched on it. And then the second part of my question is, um, can you use like the license stuff to like, well, you're using it to gain more fans clearly, which is ingenious, mm-hmm. but um, it kind of like that stuff, I would assume like pays the bills and allows you to work on the, like your true passion I would imagine would be your you create your own stuff mm-hmm. uh, is that the kind of stuff you want to continue to do is like kind of like lightly pepper in some license stuff and then keep working on on your own things so yeah, yeah two questions <laughs> yeah I'll start with the the first one about um how how hands-on was Hasbro and um no they were pretty good if there was a new character and ponies to design and the writer would give kind of a brief description of what they were looking for like for instance like this pirate pony i did some issues where there's a pirate pony and so yeah i just designed it and i sent it off to the editor and the editor passed it on and no there was there was no notes and nothing particular but i mean there might be when you start drawing the pages there might be a panel where his face looked too much too humanoid and so they're like try to keep it a bit those were in the early days so I was not used to the pony faces quite 100 percent yet but so there'd be little notes like that or um, there was one 
one character though that I didn't realize they had done previous book series on, which were certain like um, in, in the pirate pony one again, where there was like mermaid ponies. And I didn't realize that they had had a, a book with the, the illustrations already done of these characters. So when I designed them, I made them look kind of more like the ponies that you see just with the tails. And Hasbro had to be like, no, we'd, we'd rather these specific ones. And I think that was the only time they really gave me a, a note that was specific. There was that, and one time I had to like, there was a time travel issue and they went back and there were these Egyptian jackals, like ancient Egyptian jackals. And um, I might've had them on four legs, but they wanted to make them look a little bit more like mythical creatures. So we decided to like make them bipedal instead, just to, just so they didn't look so much like dogs, but they were a bit more mystical. And I think that was about really the extent of the calls that they got on the designs. And um, okay, the second question was, yeah, the licensed stuff versus the, the yeah. creator owned, but yeah, definitely the the big benefit of the licensed stuff is that it's it's helpful to get your name on people's radar, which is a huge asset. So it's like you love the particular project you're on. Like if I was on Ponies or a Gretzko, I love being associated with that, but also you, you're suddenly exposed to that fan base who likes that. Same with like Troy with Rick and Morty, like he's exposed to that fan base all of a sudden. So that gets eyes on like, who's this Troy little guy or who's this Brenda Hickey person and what else do they do? And so that's, and then, yeah, when you do go to the creator own, you hope that you reeled a couple people in. And again, that's kind of what we like to focus, what we pick for licenses to kind of what we're personally drawn to and what kind of themes or, or styles might show up in our own personal work. So, because I know some people might be like, oh, a job's a job, so I take whatever, but I guess maybe we're, we're picky because you know, we're just like that, we're just picky, <laughs> trying to curate, like, you know, we, we do this, but also kind of in line with our personal, personal yeah. projects. And So you're going to continue to kind of t dabble a little bit here and there, and that's the plan. Mm -hmm. I, that's, yeah. That's very smart to me, like, that's, that's good mm -hmm. sense, you know what I mean? I'm excited yeah. for more to create your own stuff. Oh, thank you. I was getting at. So, yeah. Yeah, very, thanks. thanks very yeah, much. Yeah. Thanks I can't wait to show you more. <laughs> I can't wait. Thank, <laughs> thanks for being here. Too. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys and all your questions, too. It's really nice to know that you put yourself out there and people respond to it. So, it's it's really huge for us. So, really appreciate it. Can you tell us like a little bit more about um, the Halls of the Turnip King? Because that is like mm -hmm. the existing creator-owned book that you made. And mm -hmm. um, so that, that's four issues that you did? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Uh, tell us yes. a little bit about that. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a funny one because um, I, I was, it spans, like the creation of it spans so many years. <laughs> so I started it many, many years ago um, before even Ponies. I was kind of, I was dabbling in web comics with this thing called In the Air and kind of having moderate, little to moderate success with it. And I was like, well, I finished maybe the first five chapters and I thought, well, this, I don't know, I, I just want to do something different for a bit. So I took this idea, um, these characters that I kind of had always in my head in the, in the background, just these silly, silly elves, silly dwarves, just these silly fantasy stories that are, you know, not heavy fan like they're not like this is any serious fantasy person would be like what is this <laughs> it's just kind of like a backdrop to kind of give them I don't know, give them some some fun environment to interact with so it's elves and dwarves um yeah just like this wacky little adventure to kind of have some fun with comics and just really goof off with the medium really after doing this um I don't know, this web comic that was a little bit drama had some comedy but so yeah it was like this idea of this lazy elf prince anyway and he was just his dad's always trying to get him to like get off the couch and make something out of yourself son like you're gonna inherit this kingdom you gotta do something is kind of the premise and so he goes on an adventure like to to meet the the dwarves and 
build an alliance with them. And so that's the loose plot. But the main point of it is like how he screws up every step of the way and all the antics that happen along the way. So the, the joy in it, it's kind of like Faulty Towers. You kind of watch this guy who is just not a good person just fail over and over again until things are kind of beyond anybody's capability to fix it. So nice. it's just kind of a way to have some fun. And I don't know, just kind of like poke fun at this silly guy. <laughs> so yeah, it and yeah, it spanned a lot of years to make. Like I started it maybe 10 years ago at this point. And wow. yeah, then ponies came, then the kid came, and then Wards Valley came. And yeah. but I just was like, I, I don't want to just like it's fun. And I hope if I'm having fun with it, somebody out there will have some fun with it. And I don't I don't feel right just leaving it on the drawing board. I wanna I wanna make sure to see this finished, which is why I broke it into the four issues. I thought if I break it into four issues and bring a new one to the Comic Con circuits every every year. I have a new one until the story's eventually done, and try to build some readers there. And then I went that route because the web comic thing, I just wasn't I wasn't working it right really well. So I was like, well, let's try this self publishing these issues and see if that works better. And so the cat's yeah. still being a pain. <laughs> Sorry, those are cats. Yeah. Yes. The, web, the web comics are tough to, to kind of yeah. really hit at anymore there was like yeah. I feel like they had their time or something and yeah yeah now it feels like the way it's going is webtoons and web so yeah. yeah yeah which is again I see the benefit of web comics and I want to get better at it so I'm really going to research that for maybe my next book I'll serialize it on patreon at first and then when I have enough maybe start seeing about putting it on webtoon to really like build a readership because when you see the numbers of people reading web comics and you like you listen to the award shows and it's like this one's winning this prize for web comic with this many readers and it's like nobody reads that many print comics i know yeah, yeah. It's, crazy. it's so crazy so it's, yeah, it's like, like oh, in the is... millions or something in it yeah, like yeah 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 so it's like how to how do i really finally reconcile this webcomic thing with myself and like try to make it work so yeah yeah awesome do, do you find do you see that or do you think that like when you're creating more and you're a creator and thing you're gonna go back to the the world or the turn of king or like you're gonna try mm. to do something else i i'd like to go back i've got two more book ideas like halls of the turnip king has a full beginning middle end but it's kind of like again I'm a Looney Tunes fan so it's I'm going to say Looney Tunes again but it's like Looney Tunes that the Roadrunners you know the the Coyotes like always beat up beat up beat up but up but then the next episode comes and he's like fine again it's, it's reset right, <laughs> so that's exactly. kind of what the Turnip King world's going to be so everything goes to hell in the Turnip King but doesn't matter it's inconsequential the next book comes and it's reset right so back. let's yeah it's so a very nice. looney tunes style so but i've got a couple other books so i'd like to i'd like to if there's enough interest i'd like to awesome cool thank you uh jason yeah, thank you got you. another question bud you got your your uh hand up again sure if you don't mind it's mm -hmm. actually sort of a follow-up to my last one about um about doing prepping to draw these licensed characters mm -hmm. and the and the the exercise and uh, the muscle you had to build to be able to draw those. Mm -hmm. So the extension question is: so mm -hmm. taking the, what you learned about drawing these licensed characters and getting yourself up to speed to draw them, did that impact? And how did that impact the way you then uh, create original characters and mm -hmm. learn to draw the characters in your mind that don't exist? In any other source material, mm -hmm. did you go through similar rigors uh, to to develop those really um, solid looks? And just I'd love to hear your, your take on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, with the Turnip King lasting so many years of production, you kind of see the art of all. And yeah, you do see the characters getting a little cuter. <laughs> so I got on ponies. And uh, my next creator own book that I was that I'm developing that unfortunately doesn't have a title. You can kind of see some of the pony influence in the eyes, as well of the some of the human characters. So I'm like, yeah, I can I can see how the the ponies have worked their way into my psyche. So yeah, we'll see how a Gretzko affects it. I don't know. I haven't done a creator own since starting a Gretzko, so we'll see if they get to be any different. But 
but yeah, I do, I do like dabbling in different styles though too. So I find it, I find it fun and refreshing creatively. So I don't, I don't mind jumping from style to style either. And yeah, we'll see, we'll see how the style just kind of naturally evolves itself <laughs> until it's like, what is, he, is she even doing? <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jason. That's a really good question, you know, because like you think about when you get on these like these well-known things and you're kind of like changing your style to like maybe fit in line with these things, like how is it then going to affect your your own output? You know, like mm -hmm. I, it, it's kind of unavoidable, you know, even if, mm -hmm. even if, like you said, you kind of started off with like an anime manga feel, yes. but then, you know, you went into the ponies and then into mm -hmm. the, I mean, I would say that Gretzko is also very anime in its feel yes. right yeah yes which is why I jumped on it I was like give me the, the right. anime thing <laughs> so yeah what uh what is what were you like raised on and like what is some of your favorite anime and stuff like that that inspired you mm -hmm. yeah definitely Sailor Moon I mean look at me <laughs> it's, it's obvious yeah. it's written all over me yeah. but Sailor Moon was my first anime obsession and then from there Pokemon which is funny because now my seven-year-old loves Pokemon so it's like well, back in my day when it was first on TV <laughs> we just get along on Pokemon which is quite funny man I did some research for another podcast about the most popular uh you like characters in the world you know mm. like you think it's spider-man or superman mm. or whatever but it's pokemon that is yeah. the, the yeah. highest grossing worldwide like yeah character. yeah it's crazy how that just lasted and lasted so yeah yeah we're yeah, not so on the... instagram selling <laughs> spider-man cards like people are for pokemon man it's insane. Mm, yeah just pokemon everything like <laughs> when when the pandemic started like we were lucky enough in my area that schools were still on but you had to wear the mask so anyway nathan went to school with his little pikachu hat pikachu face mask <laughs> pikachu backpack <laughs> and i was like i wonder what those kids undo pikachu t-shirt <laughs> pretty clear like, yeah everything <laughs> pikachu so it's really funny That's so yeah there was those were the ones i loved when i was little little and then mm. When I found out there was Sailor Moon comics, that really blew my mind. I had to get my hands on these comic books because I loved, I didn't have a ton of comics, but I loved my Archie comics and I loved Garfield, of course. But um, yeah, when I found there was comics, it's like, I need these comics. And it was so hard. Cause like I say, I'm from kind of a remote area and like right. I'm, I'm from the capital city here in, in Prince Edward Island, but the capital city is still small compared to what a capital city provincially is so right. you're like okay um we got two card shops and they're not anime fans <laughs> they have a few little things here and there so you'd get like gaps in your stories or when they tried to put the manga as like issues or whatever they were doing the anthologies and stuff so you find different comics through the anthologies like in america and mixine <laughs> like these are the things i was trying to find in the long boxes and they were like what's this 14 year old girl doing in here we don't know what to do with this and i'm just like sailor moon comics <laughs> so um yeah it was a time <laughs> did and, you uh, um you know it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for like referencing in in uh, my little pony like there's oh, always yes. were you able to ever able to like slip in some little sailor moon things or um, Amy Meberson, actually, one of the other artists, got the Sailor Moon Pony references in before me. So I was like, shoot. Uh, um, Sarah, uh, Amy, no. <laughs> but anyway, the, the colorist is a big anime fan, um, Heather Breckel. So uh, I knew she liked the one Kill a Kill. So I put some Kill a Kill ponies in the background. I was like, uh, here you go. And she, I kind of was like, I, I did this for you. <laughs> and she's like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> so, or like Little Witch Academia, I what? put a couple of those ponies in. And... I'm going to leave it to the oh, yeah. Did you, I um... told you, because he makes, he's going to make some pizza. <laughs> did you ever have a, uh, like a pitch or anything for um, Sailor Moon? Or did you ever try to be like, oh, we should make new comics? Oh, so manga, I, I manga is kind of like, you know, the creation is so associated with the creator. I, unless you do oh, doujinshi, right. like naughty doujinshi, I don't think there's a lot of like <laughs> variations from that. Right. But um, when I was a child, I had Sailor Ruby and Sailor Star and all these things. <laughs> like I colored in Crayola crayon on Hillroy, like line the line paper you put in binders. <laughs> oh yeah. I had so Been many there. of those. 
oh yeah yeah i was like it's march break i'm gonna make comics and all the other <laughs> kids are like we're going to disney world what are you doing <laughs> or we're just like having vacations with family i'm like i drew 100 pages of this thing and they're like slow down oh child so <laughs> so is that like where you got your start you were like always making comics as a kid making yeah. the fan comics yeah because i loved cartoons like disney in the 90s was so huge and sailor moon was a thing but I was a child. I couldn't, I didn't have the tools to animate. And you didn't have the technology you have today where you can just like kids can animate now, but right. um, I didn't have that. So the next best thing is comics. And I didn't really like, I knew comics from Betty and Veronica, but I didn't like, I got like the dialogue balloon thing. And, and um, my sisters and I, like I have, I have a big family and two of my sisters who were closest in age to me, we would all do comics I was the only one I always joke I was the only one crazy enough to keep going like they got sensible jobs I was like yeah I'm gonna do this but um yeah we would all do our comics or we had like store like we were always writing stories and making things and exchanging them to make each other laugh and so it was just such a huge part of my childhood and so there's yeah, I didn't have a ton of comics, but we also made a ton of comics to make up for that lack of them wow, in yeah. our lives. So nice. that's what you got to yeah. do. Yeah, if you don't have them, you make them. So yeah. yeah. Do, do you find uh, that you and Troy are pushing it on your kids or anything? Or are you trying to be like hands off about it and like mm -hmm. have it develop naturally or? Yeah, we try to definitely be hands off because we very much understand if the if it's the kids immersed in it and the parents because the parents do it, they're going to automatically be like, oh, that's not cool. <laughs> right. Like you, you can't even be like the president of the United States and have your kids be like, my dad's cool. They'll be like, oh, dad, <laughs> you know, you yeah. just you'll never yeah. be cool to your kids yeah. at a certain age. So right. we're like we kind of get that. But um, there's a few a few things that they will jump on board with. Like um, we've got. 15 year old well they're almost 15 they'll be 15 next month but they got into a few manga series and um, my little one uh, seven year old he likes some of the, he loves Johnny Boo by James Kolchaka and he likes oh, nice. um, the narwhal series I can't remember the the author that does this like narwhal and jelly series it's very young yeah and I also got like I also got what's Michael and he loves what's Michael because he loves cats which, which is this, this really old manga, but it's ridiculous. Like, I love it because it looks so weird. And so I picked it up and he loved it. And like, Nathan loves it too. He's like, bring me another one. So <laughs> it's just, this is this weird, like mini stories of this cat and like kind of slice of life. And he's like super into That's it because awesome. he loves cats. So, but yeah, yeah, Nathan's got a summer camp and there was a day where it's like, we're going to do comic books at uh, day camp today. And he's like, do I have to? <laughs> I get That's it. Awesome. I get it. It's okay. It's like <laughs> man, you'll he'll look back and be like, I was very lucky to have two amazing parents that were yeah pulling some comics, man. <laughs> from what I hear from other people, they're like, even like when you hear celebrity interviews, they're like, Yeah, they think I'm lame, but then they hit when they get to a certain point in adulthood, they look back and they're like, Why did I think my parents were so lame? They were actually <laughs> cool. So I'm yeah. like holding out hope for that turn. <laughs> Yeah, my dad's here right now. He's probably like, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I pretty much always thought he was cool. Been there, done that. As they hey. Say. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> I never thought you weren't cool, dad. I think I always thought you were cool. Well, that's good. I appreciate that. All right. Maybe I'm just saying that in hindsight, but. No, I think you. that's where it was. All right. that. Well, it's, yeah. I guess it's tough to be cool, dad. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> I mean, in fairness, the, the twins might not read the comics we make, but they do tell their friends at school. They're like, our uh, parents make yeah. comics and, and they're course. cool. And so the friends think we're cool. So it's like, OK, in fairness, they do brag about us behind our backs. We don't often cool. see it, but um, yeah, they just are not as big into comics as we are. They're like, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I see you work those long hours and I don't know if it's for me. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, that's great. All right. Oh, here so we, we go are, again. Oh, hey, Kitty. Um, it's almost so we're, his bedtime snack time. So he's very oh, so he's, like. He's ready. He knows. You, you can see he's a big boy. So he wants his food. <laughs> we are getting close to the end of it here. So it, does anyone else have any final thoughts or questions they want to uh, say? I was just, uh, I was curious about your art background. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, great. Where you went to school and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a 
program at PEI where I live um, called Holland College, and I took the graphic design course that they offered. So um, yeah, I was I was like, oh, I want to I want to do comics. I'm not quite sure where to go, and I was quite you know a nervous kid <laughs> back in the day. So I was like, I wasn't ready to leave the island. So I was like, I'll take this course. And I lucked out that one of my instructors, uh, Sandy Carruthers, was actually a big indie comic guy in the 90s. And locally, like he helped mm. co-create Men in Black. Like he did the comics for that, he drew the art. Wow. And so we had a lot of really good conversations about comics. And he introduced me to the Scott McCloud Understanding Comics series, which, you know, like everybody says, is just so huge when you discover that book. So he was a good mentor for that. And then once I, graduated then we had a an animation studio briefly in charlottetown that did like a lot of background layouts for a canadian cartoon called raspberry jazzberry jam and that's where I, well, that's where i met troy because he's got the animation backgrounds and so yeah so that's kind of how that started and a lot of a lot of what i do is self-taught um yeah i took a brief watercolor course when i was in middle school but other than that any art course i took was just whatever was available through my school. And then the graphic design course at Holland College, which was quite good for the connection I had with Sandy and kind of kind of encouraging me to take it from those, those um, pages in the binders with the, the line paper and like move it to, to the next level. So yeah. I found that very, very helpful. Yeah, so. the, work, the work is great. It speaks for yeah. itself. Thank you. Just... Thank you, very Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for being here, Brenda. It really means yeah. a lot. Um, so tell everyone where we can find you and uh, yeah. you know buy your books and and uh, follow along. Sure. Um, I I'm on Instagram, uh, Brenda under slash e under slash picky, as my Instagram, and we have a Patreon, Pegamus Pals. Troy and I share, so you know I update once a week. He updates once a week. So if you join, you get two posts every week, which is quite nice. And he's also serializing his new book, The Illusion of Life through that. So you get to see his newest creator own book, which is quite exciting. And I keep you informed like what I'm doing with my projects too, like um, with, with the Gretzko or whatever I've got going on. <laughs> and um, yeah, so there's those two. And yeah, I think those are my main ones. Like I said, I'm terrible at Twitter, so I don't really encourage people to follow me there. <laughs> But yeah, Instagram um, and Patreon, you can find me. Did I see that you're also doing some podcasting as well? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I got in with these guys at Things Are Getting Sketchy. Um, um, my, my buddy, Mike Ruth, he's quite active there. So mm -hmm. I was, yeah, I was doing a couple with them. The first one was just like, you know, just sketches and stuff, pony stuff. But the next one was like a for charity. This guy needed some help, like his family needed some help, some extra bucks. So we did like a Muppet mashup sketch day. That. Yeah, that was yeah, cool. yeah. And then next month I'll be on for they they do this uh, coaster to coaster event every month where they just draw on coasters and they oh, they nice. auction those off. So yeah, so we'll be on there again, but. But seeing my Gretzko stuff starting to amp up, I'm like, maybe I'll simmer down after that. But <laughs> it was they're they're a fun bunch of guys. Like they're really good. Um, Mike Ruth has always been a good friend of ours. He's based out of Toronto, but he's been in our area in the Maritimes of Canada quite a bit. And he's he belongs here. We're trying to convince him to move. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Him and his wife really like it here. So we're like, come to us. <laughs> come. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah, you definitely. so much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, All right, definitely. so before we go, I just want to get a, a screen grab photo mm -hmm. of everyone. We'll use this mm -hmm. for the uh, YouTube uh, banner, if you don't mind. Yeah. So uh, here we go. All right. Everyone hey. smile real nice. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yes. I'll add yes, Kevin in you. later. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the magic of Photoshop. Yeah, Photoshop well, them like in your pictures in the background, one of the pictures. Yeah, photos. exactly. Right in the bottom, like, <laughs> hey, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you again so much, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Everyone check her out all over the in the internets. Uh, follow <laughs> on Patreon. I have been for the last couple of weeks. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So thank you all again for coming out. Cartoonist Cafe brings side seats comics symposium for another month. Thank you yes, all so thank much. Thank you guys. Yep. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.